Okay, today we're going to have a look at this book. It's Fun to Entertain by Gwen Marchant. We're going to pick a recipe out of this 1960s cookbook and follow it right through and make it. So yeah, I picked this book up in a charity shop for £1.99 a couple of years ago. And it's a really fascinating book because it was published in 1965. And this kind of spans the time when Britain would have been kind of coming out of the whole mindset of wartime rationing. And so some of the recipes in here are really quite basic, but they're recipes that have ambition about entertaining and parties and uh, trying to be a little bit exotic. Some of the stuff in here is really quite interesting. So it's like hot dog casserole, which just looks like, you know, some kind of sausage casserole. We've got a 20th century beef stew. And a lot of these things actually use like a packet of soup. So a packet of oxtail soup in this one. Um, here's another one. This is uh, corned beef dumplings in rich brown sauce. And again, a packet of oxtail soup in there. But I thought the recipe that looked interesting for trying today is this one, which is savoury scones. And actually these are gonna be cheese scone pizzas or scones. This is like a scone base and then you make it into little cases and fill it with kind of pizza topping. So let's head to the kitchen and make some cheese scone pizzas. Okay, quick rundown of the ingredients for the base then. So we've got three ounces of cheese. We've got three ounces of lard. It says lard or white fat. You could use butter, but this is a recipe from the 1960s. Lard would have been the thing to use in savory scones. Quarter of a pint of milk, three teaspoons full of baking powder, a pinch of cayenne pepper, a teaspoon full of salt, and then we're gonna have 12 ounces of self-raising flour. So we've got self-raising flour plus baking powder. We're expecting quite a light rise here. I've measured this all in ounces because that's what the book is doing. And so you can convert this quite easily to grams. There's, there are loads of online calculators to convert this. The recipe also does state to sieve the flour. So I will make sure I do that. And I've weighed my bowl, but not my sieve. So let's go for, we're going for 12 ounces of flour, which is a fair old bit of flour. And what I'm gonna do actually, I'll put my baking powder in and sieve that in with the flour and that will help to distribute it a little bit. 11, 12, there we go. Now I'm gonna deviate from the recipe a little bit here because the recipe says to beat the lard. You meant to kind of beat that into a creamy texture and then rub it into the flour. I'm just gonna cut it into cubes and use a pastry blender tool. So the other dry ingredients also go in there. So the cayenne pepper and the salt. And then I'm just going to cut this cute, this lard into little chunks. Of course, you could use any other kind of hard fat. So you could use a vegetable based baking fat here if you want to. But I think we're going to find that lard has a particular mechanical consistency that provides a kind of crisp and light crust. So this pastry blender tool, it just got, it's just like a big comb really. And it just cuts the fat into smaller and smaller pieces and blends it into the flour. You can blend by hand just by rubbing with your fingertips, of course, as well. But this makes it a lot easier and slightly less messy. So no big lumps of fat remaining there. Now we're gonna stir in that grated cheese. That's three ounces of grated, I'm using mature cheddar. It just says dry cheese. So it's talking about a mature hard cheese. I'll just stir that into the flour mixture. Just kind of fold it through. Okay, add the milk and then sufficient water to bring it to a soft dough. So there's a quarter of a pint of milk going in there. So this is gonna be quite a rich scone or scone because it's got cheese, it's got lard, and it's got milk in there. The amount of water you probably need is maybe only a couple of tablespoons full. Just really to bring it together into a soft dough, which it's doing now. Now, I'm just gonna turn that out onto a board because it needs to be kneaded. It needs to be kneaded. Okay. 
And this is where this recipe kind of departs from your traditional scone recipe because normally with a scone recipe, what you would do is almost just bring it together like that and then start cutting it into scones. This recipe says to knead it for a little bit until it's smooth. So I will do that now. Probably needed a bigger board than this, but whatever. So normally you would not need a scone recipe as much as this because it develops the gluten in the flour and that will tend to make a less crumbly scone. However, I'm assuming that the that a less crumbly base for something that's meant to be a kind of pizza is desirable. Okay, that's now smooth. So that dough gets covered and put in a cool place for 10 minutes while we prepare the fillings. The filling is primarily onion, but with tomatoes. So it's like a, we're making like a pizza topping sauce. So it calls for two medium onions, finely chopped. And since it specifies finely chopped, I am gonna be a little bit more careful than I would normally for chopping onions, a little bit more precise perhaps. I know you can do this thing where you leave the root on, but I really don't get on with that method. I prefer to cut fully one way and fully the other way. There we go, that's finely chopped. Okay, and then we're just gonna fry these onions gently in two tablespoons of oil. Now in the 1960s, olive oil was in tiny bottles for medicinal use mostly anyway. So I'm using olive oil, but in the 1960s it would have just been sunflower oil or vegetable oil. Meanwhile, I'm just gonna peel and chop a couple of garlic cloves. The recipe actually only calls for one, but these are quite weedy little thin cloves. So I will use two. I'm just gonna chop it finely like that. Okay, the onion is now cooked to translucent. In with the garlic. In with four tablespoons of tomato puree. I'm not gonna try and measure that with a spoon. I'm just gonna say, okay, that's one, two. Uh, a little bit more than that, I reckon. Start a fresh tube. Four, that's about four tablespoons, I reckon. And then stir and simmer this for four or five minutes, it says, but I reckon that might need a little bit of liquid. I think I'm actually going to add a bit more oil. Oh, we, we mustn't forget a good pinch of marjoram or oregano, it says, so I've got marjoram here. So they're both related herbs, so a good pinch of marjoram. And I'll just turn up the heat and fry that off a little bit. Yeah, I think it might, look, it might need a little splash of water in a minute just to bring it all together. But we'll just cook that tomato puree first. A Little bit of salt. Not too much because the fillings are gonna be quite salty. And then I'm just gonna put a little splash of water in there. This is deviation from the recipe. Okay, and then we cover that and simmer it for a few minutes. It's now time to prepare the dough. And first, I'm just gonna grease a couple of baking sheets just with leftover bit of that lard. Just gonna lightly grease. Whoops. <laughs> lightly grease, he says. Okay, I'm gonna do the rest. I'm gonna do the rest with my hands. Just lightly grease that baking tray, just so it's got a sheen of fat on there, really, to stop those from sticking. And that'll help the bottom to crisp up as well. So the dough comes out onto a floured working surface. And it's interesting because even, I can tell that even though this is using baking powder as leavening, there's a bit of rise happened already from that baking powder working. So anyway, you need to roll this out to, it says about half an inch thick, which is about one and a quarter centimeters. Okay, I reckon that's about there. And then using a three inch cutter, I cut rounds of this as efficiently as I can. And as I say, normally with scones, you wouldn't, well, normally with scones, you wouldn't waste this, but you'd find that the scones that you re-rolled would be different and less crumbly than the scones from the first batch. But because this is a kneaded dough, it's not gonna matter nearly quite so much. 
Okay, and I'm just going to try and roll this into the kind of shape that I know that I can cut two rounds out of. One, two, kind of diminishing returns at this point, but we will get one more out. Okay, one more. And then this bit here, I'm just going to form into a ball and squish it into the cutter. Really just because I detest waste and I'm sure this will be just fine. Especially if we put it that way up. That's good. Okay, so we've now got all of these scone things, but the fillings are just going to fall off of these. This is the really neat trick of this recipe. So I'm using the bottom of a one pound jam jar, floured, and it just says press that into the scones like that and it makes them into little cases. How about that? We're a long way away from pizza at this point really, but I don't think that really matters. And we're gonna get further away from some people's preference of pizza because actually some of the fillings we're gonna use here are probably gonna offend a few people. But you know what? The only way to do pizza wrong is to insist that somebody else eats it the way you like it. Really, you know, I think people just need to get out of each other's pizzas and let them get on with it. Right, there we go. Well, that's a really neat trick for making some nice little cases like that. And hopefully those will rise up and that will contain a bit of filling. Now, in order to sort of suppress too much rising on the bases here, we need to prick them thoroughly. Like that. That will allow any steam to escape and hopefully they won't rise so much in the bottom. But for fillings, the book suggests prawns, anchovies, olives, uh, bacon and beans actually. We're going to have a look at the baked bean and bacon pizzas. That's going to be a really strange one and kind of very British, but we probably do one I think like that. But I'm going to do ham and pineapple for Jenny because she likes that. And I'm going to have anchovies and olives for me because I like that. And yes, this is going to be pizzas with ham and pineapple on them, which I understand offends some people. And here's the thing. If you don't want to have ham and pineapple on pizza, don't have ham and pineapple on pizza. What's the deal with telling other people they can't have what they want? Absurd piece of gatekeeping, telling people what they shouldn't enjoy. And the other two we'll do something else with. And I'm going to have anchovies and olives on mine. And again, some people don't like anchovies or olives, but I do. Given that this is kind of 1960s style, I need to cut these into little rings. And somewhat unusually for me, you're going to see me use a pull tab here because anchovy cans, even my trusty Brabantia has a little bit of trouble with those. Right. Time to get those pizzas topped. So each one of the pizzas gets a little blob of sauce in it. Not too much because it's obviously the sauce is wet and it's going to put too much on there. It's going to stop those from baking crisp. Then a sprinkle of grated cheese on top of each one. And same with a little bit of pineapple. I'll try, try and put the pineapple kind of in the middle. So those are ready to go for the moment. I might try and I might just try and squeeze a few more little bits of topping on some of these. Okay, and while I'm prepping these, I'm just going to preheat my oven. The book says 220C, but mine's a fan oven, so I'm going to go for 200 fan. So if you can hear a thrumming noise in the background, it is the oven, it's not the Ark of the Covenant. I've just remembered there's a third menu option, which is bean and bacon. So I'm, I've taken the cheese off of some of these and I'm going to do bean and bacon on those. That's a, a really weird combo, but the book suggests it, so I think we should try it. I have to try to separate these anchovy fillets. Well, the book calls for crossed anchovy fillets on there, but I don't think we're going to get crossed anchovy fillets because they've kind of fallen apart coming out of the tin. So, best I can get is going to be 
little crumbled pieces of anchovy, I think, on these pizzas. So not quite as neat as the book, but I hope you'll forgive me. That's probably enough. That tin of anchovies will not go to waste. I'll show you what I can do with that in a minute. Finally, for the last suggestion in the book, now I imagine the pineapple and ham people are going to explode at this point. A spoonful of baked beans in tomato sauce bit of cheese on top and then bacon on top of the cheese. Now the book talks about stretching the rashers of bacon out but this bacon's already quite thin so I'm just actually going to leave it as it is but I will cut it into strips and I think I'm just going to put like a crossed couple of bits of bacon on there because I don't want to completely enclose it. I don't think it will cook properly. Okay that's now got to go in the oven until it really rises and bakes. The book is not specific as to how long that will take, but it gives you tips on how to do it. It says pinch the sides and if they spring back, they're done. So I'm gonna start with about 10 or 12 minutes, I think. Now, I said I wasn't gonna waste these anchovies and I'm not. So those go in a takeaway container just like that. No cover or anything on them, just the lid on top. That I will put in the freezer and those will freeze and that oil will turn into like a wax and that will stay in the freezer like that for a month or two until I need anchovies again and then I can either just add them frozen directly from the can or I can thaw them out and just add them to a recipe. These have had 15 minutes now let's just see if they're done so it says just poke them and see if they spring back so yeah they are springing back they're quite crisp on the outside let's just check the ones on the bottom shelf I reckon maybe those need to be turned round. You know, fan ovens are supposed to avoid this kind of unevenness, but they don't always work out like that. So I, just, I reckon I'm just going to turn these round and give them another two minutes. Okay, well, there we go. Mini scone, or if you prefer, scone pizzas, courtesy of It's Fun to Entertain by Gwen Marchant. If anybody out there is related to or knows what happened to Gwen Marchant, do get in touch with me. Right, those are going to be far too hot to eat right now. Now, in case you're thinking this bacon isn't cooked, it is cooked, but it's not completely crispy. But in the UK, we quite often cook bacon that way. I was a little bit worried about putting these anchovies right on top like that, but they seem to have survived. Anyway, can't serve those just yet because they are going to be like cheesy napalm. So just going to let them cool a little bit before we try and serve them. But they're to be served warm with a crisp salad, the book says, so I'll crack on and make the salad. What I will do, I think just before any sp spillover cheese sets, is just run a palette knife underneath them, just to make sure that they are not bonded to the tray. Okay, well there they are, and I think they've actually turned out really well. I'm quite pleased with how those look. They are obviously not conventional pizzas, but they do look like they're going to be quite nice. So I'm just going to get a couple of these dished up while Jenny's Jenny's just grabbing drinks. Right, I'm gonna have the bean and bean and bacon and the anchovy and olive. Ham and pineapple? Yeah. Do you wanna try a bean and bacon one as well? Yeah. Okay. Right, I'm just gonna dig in and actually try a bit of this, I think, and see what it's like. So, let's have a look at the crust. The crust has gone fluffy all the way through, and it has risen more around the outside than in the middle because we pricked it which means that it's contained the fillings. We didn't have any catastrophic spillover. Let's give that a taste. Wow. Those anchovies, I think probably the anchovies and the salt in the crust and the salt in all the cheese, they're quite salty. What do you think, Jay? Yeah, they're nice. And so they are kind of soft. Yeah, that's what I like about them. Hmm. Okay, I'm just going to try biting this one actually, see what that works like. I mean, the thing with putting baked beans on anything, I always find this, you always know it's baked beans, don't you? It's like if you put baked beans in a soup or a stew or anything like that, it's just like, oh yeah, there's baked beans in here. They've got a, do you mind Eva? They've got a really distinctive flavor, haven't they? But it's all right, actually, it's nice. It, um, I mean, that isn't, it's, it's kind of a bit like beans on toast, but different toast, isn't it? Mm. What I'm impressed with here is how tender that, scone mixture is even though it's a scone mixture it's quite tender and bready it'd be good for a picnic actually hmm. 
You could do smaller versions of this as well. Because what you do is you cut them with a pastry cutter and you press a jam jar into them to make the dip. The dip. Right. But you could do that with a smaller pastry cutter and some smaller cup or, or yeah. something just to make a smaller dip. Hmm. Yeah, it's very good. Well, I actually think that the combination of olives and... Whilst I like anchovies and I like olives, I think olives, anchovies, cheese and the salt that's in the crust here is too much salt. Maybe smaller ones of these with a glass of beer or a glass of wine might be the thing. Actually, maybe these are kind of wine party type of snacks. Yeah, happy with that. So there we go. That was cheese scone pizzas from It's Fun to Entertain by Gwen Marchant. I actually really enjoyed those. I thought they were really, really good, really tasty. So there's lots and lots of other recipes in here, so we might well turn this into a bit of a series, but I really like this book. As I say, it's kind of humble because a lot of the ingredients in here that this book treats as exotic are quite commonplace these days. And a lot of the ingredients that we think of as exotic now are just absent from this. But nevertheless, there's a lot of hearty recipes in here. It is very much of its time, but there's a lot of recipes in here that have kind of been lost to, to lost to fashion and discarded along the way so i think actually i might well have a look through here and see if we can adapt a few of these things and bring a few retro recipes back one thing i really want to take away from this scone recipe is that idea of pressing the jars into the scones to make those cases is genius and i think that's got potential for a broader range of things. I'm thinking if we took a sweet scone mixture and did the same, we could actually make scone jam tarts. I think topped with a little bit of cream, we'd have a kind of ready-made portable cream tea. So that might be something I try in the future. But for now, I hope you enjoyed watching that. And this book has really become a treasure to me now. So I'm so glad I picked it up. I know that she made one other book at least. So I'm gonna see if I can get hold of a copy of that as well. I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.